Uh, for coming today, I'm hoping the weather will keep you penned in here and that uh, we'll keep accumulating people as the day goes on. Our hope for this symposium really is that we can kind of get under the surface of this topic and explore the promises, the potential, some of the approaches for of big data in agricultural research, and also delve a little bit into the challenges and perhaps some of the pitfalls that uh, might be inherent in this. Uh, one of the questions that we ask ourselves is, uh, you know, is big data really uh, here to stay? Uh, or is it just a, a fad? Is it just something that, uh, you know, is the new excitement uh, at the moment? Or is this a wave of the future or just some overhyped uh, propaganda? And I think, I think I know where my mind is uh, going in this direction, but I'm not going to uh, force that upon you. So uh, I think I mentioned a little bit about how, uh, how this process started. Uh, so what is big data? This is kind of a question that we always get. Isn't this old news? Uh, haven't we been doing this for a while? I mean, Bill gave some excellent examples of uh, you know big uh, data um, e efforts in the past, collecting large amounts of data to help us solve problems, really, uh, and and manage our societies. Really, is nothing new. Um, you can argue that William the Conqueror's Doomsday Book uh, from a millennium ago was essentially a large data set about people in the country and what they owned and where they lived. Um, and then doing something with that data, taxing them or figuring out where the young people are so they could uh, be conscripted into the, into the military. Uh, sifting through this data, uh, even back then, uh, has always been a struggle. Um, I read uh, that the 1880 U.S. Census actually took eight years to tabulate all the information uh, from that. Uh, in science, it used to be that if you wanted to learn something about nature, you would, go out, or you would go out in it and spend some time in it or go to the lab, and you'd actually have to make some observations. Uh, this is the way that many key discoveries of our time were made. Charles Darwin basically had a notebook and a lot of time on his hands, and, uh, and he didn't have Wi-Fi on his uh, two-year trip around the world, and, and yet he made some really important uh, observations. Uh, they often ended up, observations would often end up in notebooks, um, and if the authors, if the scientists were um, uh, motivated enough, they might actually get published. Uh, and if we were motivated enough, we could find that information in the literature or in some archive uh, someplace. Uh, here's one of the oldest examples, uh, entomological examples that I could find. So I'm an entomologist, so I get excited about things like this, uh, where a researcher uh, was interested in this question of outbreaks of the migratory locust in uh, Europe and Asia. And these are kind of the, the biblical plague locusts that uh, literally have been around since, uh, since people have been writing about it. This is a beautiful medieval uh, Bible, and you can see those little things kind of shooting off from the sky are, are actually all locusts. And basically, the author reached into old archives, including government documents, uh, monastic writings, where the monks would actually make notes about interesting things that happened uh, throughout the year, uh, such as this one here that was extracted uh, in, uh, from a document in 593. Um, and I've poorly translated it here from the Latin, where it says, there was great drought and famine and unusual multitudes of large grasshoppers. This was an observation at a point in time. And basically, by collecting enough of this data from a lot of different sources, um, he was able to find that there were periods of time at a continental scale where locust outbreaks seemed to be synchronized. And note here how, um, where is my laser pointer? Well, if you look at the very top uh, up there, uh, this data goes from China to Siberia all the way down to uh, Western Europe and in, uh, in Great Britain and Germany. Uh, and the time uh, series over this is pretty spectacular. Information about locust outbreaks from 300 AD uh, all the way to the, to the present. And uh, my eye always goes to kind of the mid-1300s. Not only did they have the Black Death decimating populations, but apparently there were plagues of locusts happening throughout uh, Europe at the same time. This was not a good time to be alive. <laughs> this, to me, this vignette kind of shows some of the power of large data sets. It can give us insights on patterns and processes that occur at spatial and temporal scales that really would otherwise be uh, impossible for us to, uh, to understand. And it also serves to illustrate uh, another aspect of big data research that we sometimes refer to as eco-informatics, in that the data is, is often observational rather than experimental. 
Um, it's often collected for purposes other than the ones that we end up using it for. I, I really doubt that the monks were thinking about continental scale outbreaks when they were writing about the coming plague. Uh, and we repurpose this data for ecological or environmental purposes. And, the, and I, I like the term also because it intentionally includes informatics in, the, in it as a way to highlight the data management and computational challenges that, uh, that really come with working with these really highly heterogeneous and, uh, data sets. The computer revolution and the rise of digital technologies have really changed uh, all of this. Um, I, sometimes I find it hard to believe how fast this rate of change has been. I remember when my mother would come back from work in the late 70s and she'd bring home these uh, computer punch cards that they were using for data entry at the place where she worked and, and you know, you wrote computer programs on these things and fed them into the big mainframe uh, computers. Now my iPhone 6, uh, which is a bit dated, uh, has as much computing power as 58 Cray 2 computers from uh, from 1985. I find that mind-blowing. We now live in a world where we can um, instantly capture and store information and, and retrieve it at will. That's also a key feature and for just about anything that we do. Uh, in fact, in any of our interactions that are digital to start with, uh, such as our online uh, activities or uh, using computers or telecommunications, uh, data capture is pretty much automatic. Social media, e-commerce, telecommunications, these are the sectors that have really boomed in recent times because they have access to this data. One statistic that I found from, uh, from five years ago, which is a little dated obviously, reported that Walmart uh, collects, collected at the time 2.5 petabytes of data from a million customer transactions per hour. And for those of you who can't quite fathom what that is, here's a little graphic, but basically a petabyte is a lot of data and they're doing it very uh, frequently. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, data production is expected to be 44 times greater in 2020 than it was in 2009. So this rate of data collection is accelerating. We're also becoming much more clever about uh, collecting uh, data and what we can do with it. And as uh, Bill pointed out, our smartphones are really becoming an important uh, and ubiquitous data collection device. They tell us a lot of things about how we behave and they also tell us a lot about uh, how the environment uh, behaves. Through specially designed apps such as this one here, citizen scientists are contributing a wealth of information on things like species distributions, earthquakes, uh, the climate, uh, and so on via, via their uh, connected apps. And this uh, graphic here, this uh, animated uh, animation uh, shows a species distribution map for this particular bird species based on a model derived from uh, bird watcher contributed uh, data. And you can see kind of the summer, the spring migration northwards and then the contraction uh, southwards at the end. We had no idea uh, what these migrations actually look like. Government archives are now becoming more and more uh, digital. These have become an immense source of data about how people and the environment function. Government funded research, as many of you know here, uh, including that, uh, the work that we do for NIH, from NSF, from USDA, uh, now requires that we make our data public uh, through open data repositories. Um, and uh, research agencies like NSF here are pouring uh, significant amounts of money into um, infrastructure and novel ways of collecting large-scale continental data in this case here. Uh, this is NSF's uh, Na um, National Ecological Observatory Network, NEON, that we're going to hear a little bit about uh, later in one of, our, uh, one of our talks. Remotely sensed data using satellites or low-altitude platforms such as planes uh, with mounted sensors on them tell us something about how fast plants grow, how carbon and other move molecules move around the the atmosphere and the biosphere, just to name a few uh, applications. Here you can see in uh, these silver uh, areas, these silver spots on a satellite image, uh, or multispectral uh, satellite uh, showing uh, gulf slicks uh, after the deep water uh, horizon uh, spill. And with these data, researchers were able to understand how currents actually uh, move around in the Gulf of Mexico and where to allocate uh, cleanup efforts as well. Smaller uh, private or uh, commercially operated uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, you've heard about these in the news all the time, are becoming more and more common. Um, and they offer services for customers looking for a competitive advantage. Novel sensors mounted on tractors, like you see here, 
uh, tell us something about yields of the crops, the soils, pests that are on the crops, uh, often with centimeter scale accuracy. Um, all of this information gives us the promise, at least it's been, we've been told, that, uh, that we can uh, think of new ways of doing agriculture that really takes into account these local, very local uh, fine scale variation that the farmer, that each individual farmer uh, experiences. You could think of it as personalized agriculture, uh, much in the same way that we hear about personalized medicine um, and how that is supposed to uh, transform us. So clearly technology and technological advances play a big role in defining big data. Uh, and yet, these advances are coming perhaps a little more quickly than we've been ready for, at least in the past. Questions of privacy, data ownership, and who can profit from it are really paramount since, the, since data is at the heart of this new economy that we're, uh, that we're looking at. One analysis suggests that farm data itself, just the data itself, is a 20 to $25 billion revenue opportunity. The definition of big data really has grown, maybe you know, uh, like big data itself, uh, has grown over the last few years. And I want to start with just a cartoon illustration of, uh, of uh, kind of what data might look like. Uh, here um, is what a traditional data set might look like. This is my data set. Uh, it has some observations. I put it in a standard format of like a spreadsheet. We're all used to this. You know, it has observations, which are the rows. And uh, the rows have certain things that we've uh, measured, maybe a couple of attributes uh, associated uh, with that um, for each object. And I, I don't want to trivialize these kinds of data sets. I've intentionally made it small. This is kind of small data. And it has played up until now really a central role in how we have done our science. Uh, the values that go into those little cells are really hard earned. Uh, entire careers are built on populating these, uh, these small data sets. One definition of big data uh, focuses on the volume of the data. Uh, you could think of how many observations there are, uh, adding rows in a spreadsheet uh, like this. Um, another uh, dimension of big data really talks about the, the kinds of things that we measure on each one of our uh, uh, subjects. Um, these could be the, the, the um, you know, if we can imagine each, uh, each row there as a plot of land, uh, maybe we've, we're measuring things like uh, the yield of a crop as one of the columns, or maybe the, uh, the, the number of pests that are present there, maybe the soil type, maybe the precipitation that occurred over a certain period of time, uh, and so on. So this is sometimes is what we refer to as the variety of the data. So big data has both lots of rows and lots of columns. And lately, with, uh, with modern methods, uh, we were able to collect these same kinds of data over time. Uh, so it adds another dimension to, our, uh, to this structure. Sometimes this is referred to as the velocity of the data. Data accumulates at a particular uh, rate. Um, these are sometimes referred to as the three Vs of big data, variety, uh, volume, variety, and velocity. Uh, but there's actually a, other additional characteristics of big data that are worth uh, at least mentioning uh, briefly. Um, some argue that big data attempts to be exhaustive, that N goes to all, you know, where we've fully captured the entire population that we're trying to describe. Uh, that the resolution of the data is fine-grained, and we can actually keep track of the observations from individuals uh, with, uh, for later kind of uh, relocation or, or identification. Uh, the data is also uh, flexible. We can scale it. We can add more rows. We can extend it. We can add more columns uh, to, our, uh, to our data. And uh, perhaps uh, um, what some would argue is even one of the key aspects of big data is that it's relational. That is, we can actually find common fields between disparate data sets and actually bring them together to give us these, uh, these novel insights. So it's clear that big data is much more than just about size. The difference between the early efforts working uh, with big data and what we do today really is, uh, is about scale that's been made possible through computation. Whether we're, we're in medieval England or working with satellite data today, uh, the basic elements of big data are essentially the same. We have facts, the data. Uh, we have frameworks, um, analytics, visualizations, algorithms that give us some insight about what the data looks like. And then we have some value that we try to infer from that data, some, some new knowledge that we've gained about the system that we work in, some understanding that ultimately helps us in decision making uh, as well. 
And I think a lot of the talks that you're going to hear about today uh, will touch on various aspects of, uh, of these points uh, here. In 2008, uh, Chris Anderson, the editor of, uh, at the time of Wired Magazine, wrote a, a provocative essay that I think still resonates uh, today. And he essentially proposed that through, uh, with enough data, um, we actually don't need theory uh, anymore to understand how things work. We don't need a model of cause uh, and effect. All we need is basically enough data to predict how the system responds under all conditions. And we can just bypass uh, theory. This seems like anathema uh, to science and to academia. In fact, it says scientific method is obsolete uh, here. Uh, but I think it raises some really important questions about how we understand the world around us and how we actually do our science. What are our ways of knowing? What role does big observational data play in helping us uh, understand the environment? Do, we re do you really need a model if you can observe everything? Maybe bigger is, uh, is better. Prediction and causal inference are two different things. And I think it's really important to, uh, to uh, recognize that, although they are related in some ways. And this difference has important implications for policy and for decision making, since in, in these cases, it's critically important that we, that we understand causality. The big question is, can big data help us in management and decision making? Do we need to understand that causality? In a short time, we've moved from agricultural landscapes that look a little bit like this, as pictured by our uh, very own first art artist in residence, uh, John Stuart Curry, here in a beautiful painting from the 1930s. Small family farms with some animals, a diversity of crops grown by individual uh, farmers uh, here to one that increasingly looks uh, like this, with uh, an iPad in every farmer's hands, sensors everywhere, including on these cows here. And the overarching question that will hang over us today, I think, is to what extent is the agriculture of tomorrow going to be influenced by big data-driven approaches? What role is academia going to play in shaping this future? How are we going to train the next generation of scientists, agriculturalists, and perhaps even farmers to work in this area? Will these approaches be profitable? Will they help feed 9 billion people? And maybe most importantly, will they actually improve agricultural practices so that we actually enhance the quality of the environment and make farming more sustainable for future generations? I think these are all kind of key big questions that we, uh, we should be addressing. And I think as Bill said very nicely, uh, another theme that is going to emerge today is, that, is the need for collaborations that span very diverse areas from uh, uh, experts that understand the intricacies of agriculture to computer scientists to coders, database specialists, and engineers, all of whom are really needed to take advantage of, these, uh, data -driven, uh, of this new data-driven science that we hope to do. And we really hope that this symposium is going to help us make some of these connections on campus and beyond as well. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chris who will tell you a little bit about the, the course of the, um, of the topics that our speakers are going to uh, touch on. So thank, thanks, Claudio, for covering that. And thank you, everyone, again, for showing up. Uh, I personally want to thank uh, also uh, Dean Kate uh, Vandenbosch and Cal's for supporting this, as well as choosing Claudio and I to <laughs> lead this effort uh, in the college. Um, and Tracy Campbell, you want to stand up, please? Because I don't, I don't think you get enough recognition. So Tracy really was handling all the details. Thank you. An exemplary grad student who did everything we wanted her to do and never complained once. So thank you very, very much. So I just want to take a few minutes and just walk you through sort of what you're going to hear about today and offer a little bit of reasoning why we chose certain areas. And again, we weren't able to, to include everyone that's dealing with big data. I think 95% of you sitting in the audience that aren't speaking today could get up and give a talk about how you're using probably big data in your research. And Claudio didn't invite me and I didn't invite him to speak about data, so I share your pain that I would love to give a talk to. <laughs> um, so 
the first thing we're going to kind of walk through and hear about is remote sensing science. Uh, many of you in the room probably know a little bit about this already. We've got a vast amount of information being collected across multiple platforms, satellites, aircraft, uh, UAVs, um, as well as handheld devices. And a lot of that information is providing great wealth of data on like crop health, the water nutrient status, or, or maybe diseases that are happening. And we're hoping to use that information to guide you know, management and maybe in a precision agricultural way. Um, and maybe even be able to predict yield at high spatial resolution two months in advance of what it actually is uh, at the end of the season. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about informatics, data sharing, and infrastructure. Obviously, Claudio's, you know, we're said we're collecting vast amounts of information. We need to be well organized, um, needs to be backed up, easily made available, and easily searchable. Um, Federal agencies require data management plans. I don't know how many of you, like me, really enjoy writing those. That's why I have someone else do that for me on my proposals. Um, and are we planning ahead to deal with larger and more complex data sets of the future? Um, algorithms and machine learning. So I found this Dilbert cartoon that I thought was kind of representative. And, and, and maybe you share this a little bit when you're searching the internet and you go to another site and all of a sudden there's these ads that pop up, you know, related to something else that you did. Um, so you might have your own interpretation of what machine learning might be. How many of you in the room use Google? Please put your hand up. How many of you use Netflix? Yeah, keeping an eye on you. Uh, sort of learning a little bit about what you like to watch, what others might um, like also compared to your preferences, and then does some suggesting for you. Um, those are probably uh, two examples of, of that that I just kind of learned about earlier uh, I don't know, this week, was it? Yeah, <laughs> from uh, two uh, really great grad students that came and spoke in a graduate seminar that Claudio and I are leading. Um, but it's, you know, this data deluge um, that we face and, and how might we be assisted by, by machine learning? Um, what are some of the limitations and assumptions with that? Um, challenges and opportunities? Maybe what is the new frontier? Um, and how does an academic research institution have to contribute uh, to this topic? Uh, Claudio touched upon a little bit about big data and agribusiness. If you can think about where farming has been over the last 150 years in the US. Um, very simplistic, sort of that, that vision of that painting that Claudio showed about the family farm, a diversity of crops, beautiful landscape, to one where we're almost overwhelming you know, today's farmer. And there's a, you know, a generation transition going on too. An older generation of farmers who may or may not be as willing to adapt some of that technology, a younger generation that very much wants to have the iPad in hand. Um, I don't know how many of you have crawled into a, a cab of a tractor recently, but it's got more stuff than a 747 cockpit has. That's uh, really, really fascinating. And that, you know, maybe an idea for the future is to be pulling together all of that data in a way that we can produce food in a better way that has less impact on the environment, as well as feeding a global population that's going to near 10 billion people um, in a few decades. And you know, there's just too many companies to list, obviously. It's all around us every day. And I think being here in Wisconsin and, and Madison in the Midwest, you probably pick up on this. Um, I just pulled this figure off on, on the right a few days ago about this is an estimate of the the number of data points generated on average per farm per day and an exponential increase that's generally projected. And I don't think that's very hard to imagine when you think about Claudio's example of going from the Cray computers to your cell phone, you know, in a, in a very short period of time, in just 30 years. We're very interested in learning about what others are doing. Um, you know, an idea behind this symposium and sort of the effort in CALS is where we are now and where should we be going? What's been successful? Um, and in particular, um, maybe degree programs. How should this college and the university be strategically thinking about the future? Uh, could it be cluster hires of faculty? Could it be new degree programs? Uh, so we have a couple of speakers, one that's from the University of Wisconsin system here, um, and then one from the University of Michigan talking about their experiences 
um, in their efforts, and hopefully we can learn something from that. Uh, crop breeding and plant genetics. Um, I'm surrounded by these people uh, around my office on the floor floor of Moore Hall in agronomy, and um, one of them often speaks in a foreign language, so I already can't understand really what's going on, but I'm fascinated by breeding and genetics and what that might mean. Um, obviously, we've uh, made great advances, um, more affordable fruits and vegetables, sustainable energy, reduced impacts on the environment. But this genome sequencing and phenotyping and all these big words that I don't know a lot about are generating large amounts of data. And I'm really hoping that you know, we can somehow find a better way to harness that information and make it usable to a greater array of researchers on campus. And, and I'm one of those in that group. Human behavior and, and big data, sort of on the social science side of things. Um, there's a lot of things to be thinking about related to, to crop management decisions that farmers make to avoid yield loss, how they respond to markets and weather, uh, the economics behind that, risk management, and whether or not there's a, a prediction versus causation a question here that will be looked at using big data. So later in the day, we'll hear a little bit about that. And then lastly, um, as Claudio mentioned and as Bill mentioned, you know, we'll have a discussion and uh, talk on policy and national research directions. Uh, all of the big uh, federal agencies are, are doing something with this now. It's not just USDA, it's NIH, it's NSF, it's DOE. Um, what are the future directions and research related to big data? National priorities, uh, threats to our national security, and you know, what are the challenges and, and new opportunities? Um, so we're hoping to learn a little bit from from our USDA uh, speaker at the end of the day. So I think with that, we've made it through our introductory remarks and comments. And